as promised earlier in the week, we have the one and only Claudia Psalm here. She's going to help us understand the Psalm world, understand economics. If you don't follow her on X or Twitter, it's a must follow if you have any interest in money or economy. It goes macro, Fed, fiscal, fiscal creator of the Psalm world, a recession indicator. Please welcome Claudia to the show. How are you doing, Claudia? Great. Happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. You've been a wonderful follow for so long. I appreciate you uh, <laughs> saying yes to some stranger on the internet. So uh, thank you for being here this morning. I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go to your pinned tweet and we're just going to start with this because this was done on August 7th of this year, 2024. It is your pinned tweet so they can all see this. It's a Bloomberg article, it looks like. And mm -hmm. here we go. The U.S. is not in a recession. Despite the Psalm rule indicator bearing my name saying that it is. That said, the risk of a recession is elevated, strengthening the case for the U.S. Federal Reserve to cut interest rates. Again, I remind you folks, August 7th, that was sent, and we all know what the Fed did in September. So, uh, Claudia, tell us about that tweet. Right. So back in 2019, I developed what became later known as the SOM rule. So it's a recession indicator based on changes in the unemployment rate. And to put, put that indicator together, I looked at the historical experience up through 2019. What, what increases in the unemployment rate only happened in recessions? Now it was a historical pattern. It's not a law of nature. I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm an economist, not a, a scientist, right? So the, but but it was a very solid pattern. And what it is specifically is that once the unemployment rate has risen a half a percentage point or more relative to its low over the prior 12 months, historically, with a high degree of accuracy, the United States has already been in a recession in the early months, but already in one. It's not a forecast. It's supposed to be an indicator, mm. and that we we hit that threshold this summer with the July employment report, the SOM rule quote unquote triggered. It went just it just triggered half half a percentage point. So it wasn't a big increase, but but it was in that range where the SOM rule was saying we're in a recession. And that very day when the news came out, 8 30 a.m. I was on Bloomberg radio and I said, you know, the SOM rule says we're in a recession, but SOM says we're not. <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> it's you know and and this is where this period has been extremely complicated and our simple rules of thumb have really not been up to the task and the psalm rule joins a yeah. long list of uh, our kind of go tos and and frankly what I could do to say that with conviction data that again today we got an update on was in particular looking at like GDP data yeah. looking at other parts of the economy even within the labor market things were still growing. A recession is about a contraction, and there just were not signs, broadly speaking, that we were in a, in a recession. So the SOM rule, it, it broke in that it, it indicated a recession when there was not a recession. And that Bloomberg opinion piece is me explaining, and I had for almost two years said this could happen, right? right. Because there were some very specific disruptions in the labor market due to the post-pandemic. And then we had big increases in the labor supply and immigration. So the article talks about why it is that the simple rule of thumb fell apart. And in the time since uh, we got that information, it's we've gotten it confirmed again and again that the U.S. is not in a recession. Yeah. We learned that in the third quarter, real GDP growth was almost, not quite, but almost 3% at yeah, an just annual rate. Yeah, just came out rate. this morning. Yeah, 2.8 yeah, this that's, morning. Yeah. That's not a recession. <laughs> no, that's it's really hard to have a recession at all, nearly three percent real GDP growth. Uh, kudos to you on again the rule of thumb. If memory serves, at least through two thousand nineteen, it was nine for nine as an indicator or a pattern. So since the nineteen seventies, it was perfect in that it only turned on inside of recessions, and it always turned on in a recession. Uh, if you go back, there were two periods in the late 1960s and the late uh, 1950s. Hmm. There's an episode where it turns on, then turns off, and like six months later, we're in a recession. So there are there are historically some quote unquote false positives, but it's it's pretty accurate. But again, it's a it's a pattern. It's not. Right. There's nothing magical about the half a percent. And and what another way that I've seen this underscored is people have wanted to take the SOM rule and apply it to, say, 
Canada or Australia mm. or other countries or even U.S. states like California or Kansas. And and right. it you can't really do that, right? The, the trigger, yeah. the actual formula was very much based on the historical pattern, like trying to capture... Um, those those break points and it's uh but there's there's a logic to it i'm not it wasn't just you know yeah. just pulling out numbers once the u.s labor market gets some momentum going it can keep going right and then yeah, in when, a recession when, that's a bad direction yeah when I, again i'm just you know a guy who studied economics and, and studied the economy for 30 years no, nowhere on your scale when, but when i look at the psalm rule what it always meant to me is it's kind of a rate of change and to mm -hmm. your point when you look back at the labor market, when and if it breaks, it takes the elevator. It breaks hard. And that's yeah. why the Somra always made logical sense to me, because it's to me, it's a rate of change uh, tool. Is, is that fair or am I off? Right. It it gets an aspect maybe even of momentum. Yeah, there you go. Not quite. Oh, it's just that the, with the unemployment rate, we we have gone into recessions from very low unemployment rates. I mean, you have to go back to the 1960s when unemployment was like really low in general. But we've had times where we've gone in with very low unemployment rates and we've gone into recessions with relatively high unemployment rates. True. So this idea of where it's the change and, and a recession and a, you know, a, a turning point in the business cycle, it's really about some abrupt change. Yeah. I love and, the idea of and, momentum. Momentum's a yeah. great word. Yeah. And and one of the reasons uh, the Psalm rule kind of gave a false positive or broke uh, this time, I've heard you talk about, so these are my summary of your words, mm -hmm. is is really migration, right? We, we we basically messed with the denominator in this is analysis, and that it really hadn't happened before. We, we just had a lot of immigration, and, and it's really the denominator that changed. Is, is that fair? Do I understand that correctly? Well, absolutely the case that the supply of workers – changed supply, pretty yeah. abruptly. And we saw early in the pandemic, we had millions of workers drop out of the labor force, yep. not just get fired, but, but just walk away from work. And so we had, and then we went into a period of, well, the customers came back a lot faster than the workers. And so we had labor shortages. So there was a period where the unemployment rate was actually pushed down because we were missing workers. And remember, Correct. the SOM rule is all about changes, right? So I've got mm -hmm. the reference point is an unusually low number because we had workers walk away. And then we had a period, both the immigration into the country was a large and rapid reversal. Like it really had shut down during the pandemic. And then it, we had a lot of immigration come in all at once, but we also had people come off the sidelines. So we had True. prime age working women hit an all time high for participation. So just in general, we had a great labor market that was bringing workers in. And what happens is it can, timing is everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we get a big group of workers. They're looking for jobs. The labor market had already kind of cooled off some. We weren't in like the big heat of the labor shortage. And so it just takes time. So you mm -hmm. had unemployment rising to some extent just because the jobs were catching up with the workers. Mm -hmm. And and that I mean, when they do, that means we've got even more workers. We can do even more, produce more. That That's not a recession. That's, that's a growth spurt uh, mm -hmm. in the making. But it's that, but in a recession, you have less demand for workers. And that's why you start piling up in terms of the unemployed. Now, of course, this time has to be complicated. And we have a mix of both. We certainly have seen demand for labor, uh, particularly uh, new entrance to the labor market. Like it's gotten a lot harder to come out of high school or out of college and go find a job. Whereas if you already have a job, the layoff mm -hmm. rates have been really low. So we have a labor market that's not quite doing what it normally does, right? Like you've got kind of the employers seem to have this, like we hold on to workers, <laughs> that's good, but we don't want to hire more. Well, that's not good. And that puts a lot of pressure on the labor market. And it so happened that it came at exactly the time where we had a, a big group of people coming in and looking for work. So yeah. it's the SOM rule was picking up on the fact that things have, have softened some. I mean, this is, you know, the Fed picked up on this as well. And that's part of justifying their, you know, getting going with the rate cuts. But it's, but it like, it overdid it, mm. right? We got across the half a percentage point threshold in part from these labor supply effects, which frankly aren't recessionary. Now, anytime we have people who are looking for work who don't have work, that's a problem. 
because right. they could be out there producing and and contributing. But it's a different kind of problem than saying we're on the edge of the cliff, falling into the recession. Yeah. Well, let's talk about really up to date jobs numbers. This morning we got the second of two. We got obviously the Jolts report earlier in the week, which frankly disappointed to the downside. We got ADP report, which surprised to the upside. We got a big number coming Friday, which I think expectations are still for a positive hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on what's happening in the labor market now? We, it's unfortunately it's going to be tough to get a good read on what's happening in the labor market. We, we've gone over many months, if not the last few years, through a process of what often gets called normalizing, mm. right? We had these labor shortages where there was just so much demand for workers and wages were increasing and we were hiring to build back from after the pandemic. And it just wasn't sustainable, right? Like that, that's not, it, it was too, it was tough, frankly, on everybody involved to have that kind of a labor market. So we've seen a gradual moderation so we have payroll increases month over month that are really pretty similar to where we were before the pandemic. And that was a great labor market. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the unemployment rate is still right around 4%, had a period below 4% for the longest stretch since the 1960s. I mean, we broke that during the summer, but I mean, it just really has been good. And yet the direction is is worrisome or at least mm -hmm. worth keeping an eye on in that that moderation we haven't seen any signs of it really leveling out right it's it's good that the payrolls are back to about where they were before the pandemic it's been a little less clear in the monthly data recently if we're going to kind of hang out there or if it's going to continue to chip away to the south and that would that would be a problem and in the jolts report for this past week, the what was for the for the month of September, the 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 metric that I remain most concerned about is the hiring rate, and mm -hmm. so that has gotten back down to levels of about 2014, and oh, that was okay. not a good labor market. That's like a six seven percent unemployment rate labor market. Now at the same time, the layoff rate, as I mentioned before, has stayed really low. So yeah. you have uh, the labor market's not good. It's not particularly good if you're out there looking for work. It's really pretty good if you have a job. Now, that's not one of those two things is going to, in all likelihood, shift, right? Like employers are either going to be optimistic and want to keep their employees and grow their labor force. So we'll see hiring rate come up, layoff rates stay low, or they'll get to a point where they're like, no, no, we really don't need all these workers and the layoffs right. will come. Uh, now from, you know, the one month, you know, Jolts was something of a mixed bag. There was some good news on the hiring rate, less good news on layoffs, the vacancies. But in general, we, we just, we need a little bit more to see if, my impression in recent months is we have settled into a pretty good place, but we're bouncing around it. So we have okay. some months that look a little weaker, some months that look a little stronger. Again, I'm concerned until the hiring rate starts coming up in a meaningful way. I think we'll be in that, you know, bouncing around uh, place. But, but yeah, but all eyes are on the employment report for October that we'll get on Friday. And it it's going to be a mess in all likelihood. <laughs> it, Got hurricanes they, and... Yeah, because we have, you know, two hurricanes, Helene and Milton, that were close to uh, the reference week. So that's sure. the everything that we everything we know about uh, jobs in the employment report. It comes from the week that includes um, the 14th, like the pay period that has the 14th of the month. So that's how it's consistent over time. It's actually looking at a week, not the whole month. Hmm. And the surveys have different ways that they treat. Like, how are you counted if weather has made it not possible for you to work? And then on top of the two hurricanes, we also have an ongoing strike at Boeing that fell in the reference period. So that's where the consensus is a, about a hundred, a little, a little bit more than a hundred thousand per for the month. That's that's not a, a great number, but there are estimates that that behind those. Uh, the consensus forecasts are estimates of somewhere between 50 to a hundred thousand payrolls is knocked off because of the hurricanes and the strike. 
Mm. So okay. if you put that back on, then people are saying, oh, we think we're around 200,000. That's that's great. That's okay. That would be yeah. right in line with um, kind of pre-pandemic and right in line with what we think is a good uh, labor uh, labor market. Now, the, the ADP data, which comes from different source uh, and, you know, conceptually similar, but there's no reason the numbers have to line up. The ADP data didn't really show much of that hurricane Boeing effect. So those numbers look okay. pretty good. They look more like that that 200,000 trend. So we'll see. I'm not, uh, I'm prepared for the payroll numbers in particular to be pretty messy on Friday. I think we understand why that is. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, when it's these kind of issues like hurricanes and, and strikes, they'll put a notice on the release. So the experts will help us say, yes, weather appears to be affecting payrolls. And yes, here's how many Boeing workers are on strike. So they they kind of help make sure everybody's starting out with the same set of yeah. set of facts as they're debating it. Um, it. But things like the unemployment rate shouldn't be as affected as much. Uh, and there are just other places in the release to kind of go and look for, is this a one-off mm. or is it weaker or it could be stronger too, right? Like we, we really yeah. could see anything on Friday. Yeah. Any, any thoughts if, if a hundred K is the over under, would you just wild ass guess below or above, or you don't play that game? So on my sub stack, so stay at home macro. So play on my last name, Sam this week, my piece is on, on the payroll report. And essentially I'm, I'm at least making the case about why one should think about taking the under and, and the under in particular, I, I think we have a recipe for what could be the first negative payroll print. That's funny. Yesterday you put out a tweet about anybody brave enough to take a negative number. And I replied with negative 25,000. That was something yep. you sent out yesterday. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be pretty messy and, and the headline print's going to be negative. But again, to your point, there'll be a bunch of footnotes about why mm -hmm. that's negative. Yeah. So. And we have, you know, the, there are times like, again, this labor market in the three years before the pandemic, great labor market. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of month to month volatility and, you know, what the payrolls were. And in fact, in September of 2017, we had a negative print mm -hmm. on the initial. It was revised up some, but it, it initially printed a little bit below mm -hmm. um, zero. And September of 2017 was Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. I so it's them. exactly that kind of situation where we can get this extra noise. Yeah. And my argument in the post is even if we have a negative print, it could be entirely consistent with the labor markets growing at the pre-recession right. trend or the pre pre-COVID trend. It's just right. we've got this extra noise on top of it. So, but it'll be one of those reports that Anybody coming in with a story will find something to help yeah. them tell their story. I, I totally agree. <laughs> I, I agree. I'm curious, what, what were your thoughts when you saw that 818,000 adjustment? I think that was two months ago when they adjusted the, were you surprised by that? Was that bigger than you thought? Cause that, that's pretty massive. It, it was somewhat higher, but largely in line with the expectations going into that release. We, we get a sense, um, you know, the, 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 I mean, first of all, I have to say like big revisions to me or just revisions in general are a sign of the quality of our statistics and not, uh, a sign of evil doing, uh, which is what I often get told online. But it's, <laughs> the yeah. thing is the, 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 payroll numbers. So it's, it's off of this, uh, the second week of the month is what we're always trying to measure. And we get those data, not like three weeks later, right? The beginning of the next month. And so, but to do that, the, the agencies use surveys. Mm -hmm. And while it's, you know, tens of thousands of individuals, tens of thousands of businesses, it's still a, you know, a, a, a drop in the bucket relative right. to how many workers and businesses we have in this country. And so we start out with these surveys that are well-designed, but they're going to be imprecise because they're surveys. We don't go out every month and do a full census of right. the entire workforce. So, but then over time, when we get to that preliminary estimate of the annual revision, which they put that annual revision in every February. So we're kind of getting a heads up 
of what you know what's going to come in uh, later in the early in the next year. That the Bureau of Labor Statistics goes to the state unemployment insurance agencies. And that is much more like a census because an employer does have to report out how many people they have on payroll for, you know, these programs. Now there are other workers that aren't covered by social security. And so there's other sources of data that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses, but that 800,000, that's much more like a census of, right. of the workers. And, and so that's a more accurate. Now we, we don't want to wait six months to get our first read on the U S labor market. So these, these things all fit together. Now it is the case that whenever you're in a pretty, when you're in a, a rough ride period of the economy, especially around turning points, you can get fairly large revisions. And sometimes that can tell you something, right? That the initial survey, not just the survey, but they also think it's, really wonky here. Uh, they have to do an adjustment for what are what they call births and deaths, Birth of, deaths yeah. of, of, of companies. And, you know, cause again, it's not a census at every point in time, they kind of pick a sample of mm -hmm. sir or a sample of businesses to survey. Well, in the survey period, some of them are going to stop being businesses and some new businesses will come into being. Right. Mm -hmm. So we know that are these surveys, they just can't quite get the the dynamic aspects of the US economy. So there's a model that kind of adds on and sometimes subtracts off, you know, in this estimate of how many like new companies are being created, new companies are being uh or current companies are are ending. And that had been adding a good bit. And if things start slowing down in the economy, well you can see how that model might start getting off Yep. off track. And so then when you bring in this more census like information, well, it's like, oh, no, no, actually, mm -hmm. we didn't add all those extra jobs. So it it makes sense. And yes, this was one of the larger uh, revisions. But you go back and there were the you go back to periods and it was like early in coming out of the Great Recession was another period. So it, it kind of makes sense. And it was worrisome, right? If you start having big revisions and you're talking about, oh, we could be in a recession or one could be coming, like that's not a good place to, <laughs> no. uh, feeling to have. Um, but it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's more information. And it did, as soon as we had that, it has shaved off some like, it's not that just because you've had down revisions, you're going to have more, but I think it did take the Fed has said they're they're thinking about this. Yeah, like when they say these at, yeah. big numbers, like we saw last month, maybe like they're just a little extra big, right? Kind of shave it off a little bit. So it it makes it complicated, and I can understand why people are frustrated with it. And I would love to have mm -hmm. the number right out of the gate, but that's just not that's not the way this works. Yeah. Like yourself, they're not uh, not even college educated in, in economics. Would you say that you know if they were going to watch one number every week for the job market is just quite simply uh, on the jobless claims on, uh, every Thursday? Just watch that. I think we've been trending right around two thirty ish. We did have one pop to two fifty five a couple of weeks ago, but no concern at two thirty. But if it popped to three hundred or three and a quarter, that's that's a worrisome sign. Is that is that what the average American should look at? I'm not a huge fan of okay. the week the weekly tracking number. Um in, in just in in general. I still think if you wanted to track one thing about the US labor market, it'd be the unemployment rate. Okay. I mean, I think and that's, that's today at four one. Is that today? It's at four one. Yeah. Okay. For September is at four one. Now I think with claims, it's the same principle applying like what I use in the SOM rule is looking at the changes. So I have abs absolutely have been watching the claims, the initial claims data. Uh, the continuing claims data. So, you know, people coming on unemployment insurance, people staying on unemployment insurance. Uh, there's a lot of, um, it's administrative data. So, you know, I had people ask me, you know, the SOM rule, I use the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate we get every month, but as you said, claims data we get every week, right? Like, so this could be even faster. And I've had people ask me why I didn't use the claims data. And one of the one aspect of the SOM rule is I wanted it to be simple. It was mm. the design of it was to be used in fiscal policy to have like Congress use it uh, in recessions. Ah. But uh, the I said I didn't want to have to put 
an indicator in for deer season in Michigan, right? Like with the claim, the initial wow. claims data, you'll see little notices about adjustments made for various things that have happened because that, that's life. I mean, you know, in the, in the state agencies, yeah. they're having to deal with, you know, plant closures and this and that, but it's like, that was, that's way more, uh, information than I wanted to, to deal with in yeah. the indicator, but, but it has been, you know, watching the, I think in particular, watching the changes in the claims, I do worry because programs can, they're like details to the programs that can make it sometimes hard to compare across long periods of time. Mm -hmm. So an increase in the initial claims to me is more meaningful than just saying, oh, it crossed some particular threshold. Okay. So again, a rate of change. Watch, watch the, yeah. the rate of change or, or momentum. I think we said earlier makes total yeah. sense. Um, I, again, I think Jerome Powell has said this, but again, it's some kind of Fed speak. So I thought you're, you're much more experienced here. Does it is it fair to say that the Fed, as it currently sits, uh, rule, you know, they're watching labor as priority number one and not inflation? Clearly, a year or two ago, it was inflation, inflation, inflation. Has that rotated or pivot? Now it's labor they're watching most acutely. This is absolutely a dual mandate Fed, right? So they are cognizant of both their stable prices, which they've defined as getting inflation to 2%, mm -hmm. and the maximum employment. So basically getting as much employment as we can get while keeping inflation under control. What has shifted for the Fed is not that orientation. Like they have their dual mandate. They've time and again shown a commitment to it, probably in a way that Feds of the past haven't even managed to do, right? The dual mm -hmm. mandate came along later than the, just the inflation mandate. Um, but what changed is that in the past year, inflation has really stepped aside as a problem. It has, we have moved down. And again, with the GDP numbers today, like we are running inflation at, or even maybe a little below the 2% trend. Now it, we're not all of the woods and there's always reinflation risks and, you know, core inflation still has particularly through the shelter component, yep. you know, is being, is being somewhat stubborn, but in terms of where the concerns are, we've gone as inflation has gotten much closer to 2% and is, and is continuing to move in that direction. Right. So like we can see where it's headed. Mm -hmm. We have had these concerns come up about the labor market because there's been this moderation and it's gotten to the point where it needs to level out and it has not convincingly done so. And this summer in the run up to the first rate rate cut by the Fed, it was really not clear that the labor market was in a steady place. And that's what the Fed stepped in. And they did a bigger cut than normal, but I take them very much at their word of this recalibration, uh, which essentially in fed speak is we messed up uh like they should <laughs> have they should have cut in july like given what they knew later you know it would have been appropriate to start cutting by 25 basis points in july mm. they didn't do that they got some information like two days after the july meeting being like oh baby you should have cut <laughs> in july <laughs> and Whoops. and they had they talked about it right so i mean it's not like they were so far away from it and then by the time they got to the yeah. september meeting it's like well no we really Cutting in July would have been a good idea, and we should cut in September. So we're just going to gather the two of them up together, and then you know start down the path. Um, the news since then has been more positive. You know, knock on wood. We've got the employment report will be a important one, but they're now in. They're now set up to have a more cut by twenty five basis points at the meetings. And yeah. probably do that for a while until they make a little progress and then hold back and kind of see, do they need to cut more or mm -hmm. do they just let it sit where it's at? You know, one of the things we've heard them clearly say is they want to get less restrictive, right? They want to get back to neutral, mm -hmm. R-star, all of this fancy econ speak. I've heard different Fed presidents talk about it being between three and three and a half. Uh, I think Michelle Bowman is the one, the outlier. She might think it's more like four. Where, I mean, tell people why the neutral rate is is so important in it. And oh, by the way, it's also not really known. It's it's a best guess. Right. Well, I didn't even know if I'd call it a best guess. It's just we don't we don't know what it is. We don't know. Uh, yeah. But but the concept of it is really important. You know, we can argue about the numbers, but the concept. So the idea is okay. What is the federal funds rate? 
when the economy is back to normal, when the Fed's action, so what it's chosen as the funds rate is neither pushing up the economy, nor is it pushing it down. It, mm -hmm. I like to talk about it as like the Fed's out of the way. You okay. know, like there's always going to be a federal funds rate, but it's like the Fed has set their rate to a place where they're just, they're happy with what things are at. We're at the dual mandate where, you know, there's no reason for them to be trying to smooth things out. Mm. I mean that, you know, so, okay. So that's what we're looking for. But what determines the actual number is what does that economy look like when everything yeah. is back to normal and we're at the dual mandate. And one thing I've argued is that, you know, with the, the really good GDP numbers we've been getting, so some, we had a lot of <coughs> strength in the economy, this could be consistent with a, a neutral rate that's higher because yeah. a strong economy can tolerate a higher interest rate because when the economy is strong, income growth is strong. Right. We can we can pay those mortgage payments because we have bigger paychecks. So <coughs> sorry. It's okay. Take Drink some water. Care. You're okay. Oh goodness. <laughs> so um <coughs> right. So it's but that's where there's I think sometimes when we talk about the neutral rate as a number, like right. it's three and a half or it's four, we have to like, what is the context for that? Like, what else? What's GDP? What's debt to GDP? What, you know, what's inflation? Like, there can be good reasons <coughs> and bad as to why that neutral rate could be high. Yeah. One of the things that I've started to share with my audience, and again, this is this is just one guy who reads a lot of stuff, not a professional like you, but I was trying to answer for my audience <laughs> Why did mortgage rates basically go up 100 basis points? Why did the 10-year note go up, I don't know, 60 basis points after the Fed cut 50? And one of the things that I started sharing with the audience in the last 48 hours, maybe 72 hours, is, is I don't think it's, you know, some kind of conspiracy, you know, to help Biden, you know, the Democrats. I don't, I don't think it's any of that. I actually think what might be happening behind the scenes is the bond market or the smart money is reducing the odds of a recession, right? Maybe the smart money thought a recession was was here or coming, and they obviously know what the Fed would do at that point. They would cut to stimulate the economy. And, and maybe what the bond market is saying, to your point, the neutral rate's higher. We don't have much more to go. And if mm -hmm. that's the case, that would take all the long end higher. Am I all wet or is that possible? No, I, you know, I think that's another really important angle to bring up on it. And if you think about before the Fed cut, you know, things were starting to look a little dicey in right. terms of uh, the the economy. And we also had, we have this very unusual situation that we were set up for a cutting cycle, mm -hmm. right? Inflation had come down without a recession, which I always said we could have this, but this was very, this was unusual. And so now we have a Fed that inflation's come down and the Fed's like, we need to start cutting. And people are like, well, you don't need to cut. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, they do, because they have this thing called the dual mandate. And if they keep sitting on top of the economy, uh, you know, the other side of it will will collapse. But so you had this mix, I think, of the market pricing for the Fed's rate path of people like me who are saying the Fed needs to just get out of the way. Like we're right. we're coming to the soft landing. It's time. They're restrictive. Look at mortgage or like look at interest rate sensitive sectors like autos, like housing, you can see that the rates are having an effect. So it's time for the Fed to cut. But then you also have people who are like, the end is nigh and, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're going to be a recession and then they'll be cutting because what got priced in looked like a soft landing Fed path, right? Like if we really were to go into a recession, we're talking hundreds of basis points out right. of the Fed funds, not like, no question. 50, 25 here. You know, I mean, like this is so, so you have this, you have a mixture. Whenever we look at the market pricing, it's like you have a mixture of narratives underneath it. And if one piece starts to unravel, and I think the recession piece really unraveled quite a bit. I mean, it may, it may still come back, you know, we, mm -hmm. things, things repeat, sure. but, but that just that coming out is saying, you know, Hey, if we avoid a recession, that's avoiding some real scarring and it's avoiding the 
you know, the chance of going back to the zero lower bound. I mean, yeah. if you watch Europe and I, they're not, it's, they're not in that dire of a place, but given their growth path and where they're at, those risks of having low rates again, because of weakness are much more pronounced much higher. still yeah, than they higher. are in the U S. And so, you know, that, that strength piece. Yeah. I think about the, the stronger economy can support the higher rates, but you're absolutely right. The other part of the stronger economy is the, we have avoided a recession. So, so, down. so I might be onto something because again, I'm, my audience yeah. is definitely very real estate focused and a lot of people are going, why are rates up hundred basis points? And again, I don't think it's a comparison conspiracy. I just think it's a smart money going, you know what? We may have this no landing scenario 2.8% GDP growth, yeah. you know, unemployment, you know, below four or five. It's, it's not a terrible economy. Yeah. I, you know, I think there's some pieces, like there's just a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? Because again, this, while I kind of poo poo and I mean, I love Fed Chair Powell, whenever he gets asked about the neutral rate, he like just hems and haws. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's like, he's the one, everybody wants to know what he thinks that number is. He is not going to say it out loud. And you yeah. know, he has an opinion he's on not it, gonna, but he's going to say it. No. <laughs> so, but he like, but it is important, right? People, markets are making bets and putting money yeah. on where are interest rates going to be a year from now, two years from now, 10 years from now. Correct. Right. Exactly. So like that, that is not, is just not a theoretical construct for someone putting money in. And, and so you're trying to make these judgments in a just wildly unprecedented, unusual setup coming out of the last four and a half years, we have in the US what looks like could be a productivity boom, potentially higher trend growth. We've had higher population growth that isn't totally well measured, but it's clearly in some of our numbers. And it's like, and you're trying, and then you have a Fed that is dealing with like, what's the paradigm here? Yeah. You know, and they're tracing out with data and they're not giving a lot of guidance because they've gone into this hyper data driven, you know, like we're just going to put our head down, <laughs> which I think I understand why they're doing it. But I can also understand why it like really creates some market volatility because markets are trying to filter data the way the Fed filters it. And it's just really tough. And then you do add on top of it. It's an election yeah. and fiscal has has been. There's all this uncertainty, has been growing uncertainty about how, like, the fiscal position of the U.S. And is that a problem? At what point could it be a problem in markets? And then you have candidates who clearly, like, neither of them really has a plan to rein it in. <laughs> no, there'd be a lot I of don't think is, I don't necessarily think is a bad, like, you know, into the kind of, I don't, I'm not a pro-austerity person. But then... You just, there's so much uncertainty. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm pretty impressed markets hold it together because like this has been layer upon layer of uncertainty. And then what they're trying to deduce is a pretty complicated, like where, like the neutral rate is the sum. It really reflects where we end up. And that forecast is harder than... Mm -hmm. Than ever yeah. to, to me, make. to me, it's being pulled up. I think that's exactly what's happening. The bond market, the bond market's a forward indicator of what's going on. So I, I, I think the neutral mm -hmm. rate is the guess or the estimate or the prediction is, is it's not three. It's probably closer to four. Uh, and I think that's what happened. I don't think it's some mysterious plan behind the scenes. I just think the markets are saying we can handle higher rates, uh, which is interesting. Back to the labor market mm -hmm. again. Something else I'm sharing with my audience is. You know, I think the labor market, you know, as we exit 2024 is not the same labor market as 2019 structurally, right? 2019, everybody went to the office. 2025, not everybody goes to the office. 2025, mm -hmm. according to some research, there's 24 million solopreneurs doing content creation, right? Like we're doing here didn't really happen in 2019. So one of the things I think about all these models that economists have is they're just out of date for the new economy. I, I think the economy is just structurally different, you know, heading into 2025 than it was pre-pandemic. Uh, and I don't know that the models have caught up. Right. Well, I think... Oh. You froze there for a minute. Oh, Did you? Oh. Nope, you're here. Yeah, okay, Hi. here. Um, yeah, so 
this right there's always this balancing act of trying to put models and frameworks together and then go you know take reality to them right and i and i tend as an economist to live in the data space mm -hmm. right so and, and be very empirical and and that adds that has served me well during this cycle because it it can free you up from some of the vestiges of the model mm -hmm. right because you can have new kinds of data new kinds of relationships it can be a more flexible um you always have to have those models and guiding principles like you said you're comparing now to before right so that you have right. some something to ground it with the one of the aspects of the labor market like broadly speaking that i think is pretty exciting is we saw early on in the pandemic a a real surge in business applications yeah, so sole, exactly. sole proprietors, so small yep. businesses, some with or without employees. I was one of those. I became an independent uh, economist at, in 2020. Yep. So uh, partly by duress, but like I, you know, did, <laughs> I, I was part of that movement. But what we saw over time is those application rates have stayed high, not as high, right? Like settled down some, but, but nothing like before oh, the pandemic. Very, very and one of the pieces we had really seen a, a slowdown in productivity growth before for several years before the, uh, the pandemic, even actually starting before the great recession. And, uh, one feature that economists had established looking at the, the data on, on businesses, the smaller businesses is they were aging. Mm. Right? We just didn't have this dynamism and it's the small young companies that are the big growth drivers because, you know, if they hit the lottery, they're going to bring in the, the, you know, grow and become. And so it was, we were losing that because the, you just didn't have the business applications. So it's really hard to tell how much staying power that, mm -hmm. you know, pickup has had, but that is huge potentially huge in terms of keeping the productivity growth that we've seen and i also think the technology like work from home other kinds that have been able to bring people into the workforce who might not have necessarily been yeah. able to before like disabled workers have had an all-time high labor force participation uh more recently um working with or women with young children so and other groups that you know required some degree of flexibility with their work mm -hmm. time have technology has helped for many to do that. So that we've seen some real benefits in terms of productivity growth in recent years. And the holy grail is do we keep that going? Because even a quarter percentage point on trend growth, yeah, like that adds up. And, no, exactly. Uh, yeah. So I think that is definitely something, again, when you look at numbers of about solopreneurs and, and you know, uh, social media, this or that, there's mil tens of millions of people doing this now and being paid. Uh, so I just think that's, you know, that's a structural change that will come out in the wash later. Uh, I guess I want to go back to something that I shared with my audience. I think that's, when was that Jackson Hole speech? Was that 21 or 22 when he said, I'm basically going to start raising rates? Was that 21? 20, 22 was his, there will be pain. There will be pain. Yeah. So let's go back to yes. 22. One of the things that I told my audience way back then, so this is going back, is I believe that Jerome Powell was going, was on a mission to break the Fed put. Uh, my, I haven't talked with my audience this for the last year or so, but I'm just curious when he said there will be pain, you know, that infamous six minute speech or whatever it was, do you think Powell was had a vision of finally breaking the fed put where you know the fed's yanked by the market do you think that's true or not really so the the fed has a complicated relationship with the market in the <laughs> the fed so the fed's mandate is inflation and employment correct right so these are in the quote unquote real economy okay but the the way the fed reaches the real economy is through financial markets Right. The Fed's tool is an interest rate or some, you know, kind of pushing around on interest rates. And so the and and the federal funds rate, like no business or person borrows from the Fed. Right. So it has <laughs> no. to end up in one of the, the market rates. And it often ends up, you know, the the like the the 40 year mortgage rate, the like some of the credit, like things that are longer term, like the 10 year treasury is is a much more of an anchor for. Mm -hmm the kind of uh, market rates than the Fed funds rate. 
Right. So there is this dance of like the Fed needs to like because they're working through the markets, they need to have a sense of what what are the like and we've we've certainly had cases recent where you know the Fed will say the Fed is being restrictive, but you can look at some measures of financial conditions, particularly more recently if you pulled in measures of like stock prices, mm-hmm. and it'd be like these are not restrictive, right? <laughs> like these look great. So it is this kind of trying to figure out what you know is are the financial conditions where the Fed wants them to be to in service of that dual mandate. And again, there are so many links in that chain that it, it gets pretty complicated. The other the other piece, the Fed, the Fed has been very focused on, maybe sometimes too focused, is they don't want to surprise the markets. Right. So there's an aspect of whether it's the Fed caving to markets, there can often be this dance of like the Fed getting the markets to expect what the fed is going to do Mm -hmm. and it's always fun when some important piece of information like before the september fomc meeting happens during the blackout and we have it we go into the meeting with everyone being like oh they're going to cut 25 and then you have you know fed governor waller who clearly had the job of going out there to signal 50 and managed to signal 25 right like and so then (laughs) you have to like you have to bring in the big guns of the wall street journal to be like no 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 (laughs) like actually he meant to say 50 (laughs) and so uh like that was just that was absolutely nick t nick t yes yes (laughs) but yeah i mean gosh so the fed like and i get it in principle i understand what they're trying to do it's that was really that was really messy but at the end of the day you need to do the right policy and i Mm -hmm. i was on board with and i had not only said i thought there was a good case for 50 i also was out there saying the fed would cut by 50 Nice. Which I mean, I'm sitting on CNBC right as it's announced and being like, well, let's see, because I'm on like multiple panels of the only <laughs> economist here who thinks 50. And this is like, oh, my gosh, oh, gonna, yeah, you, I think yeah. it was like nine percent or something, some very single. Digit yeah, number but 50. but it was it was very much listening. I mean, I had strongly felt that the case was there for 50. Like, I think they had dragged their feet and it was time to get going. Mm-hmm. And I take very seriously signs of momentum. Like once once you lose the labor market, it's. I mean, the Fed does not have the tools to stop a recession when a recession has started, right? Correct. They can yeah. they can limit the damage, they can you know, but their most powerful is ahead of ahead yeah. of the ahead the, of the, the mess. And so I mean, I felt it pretty strongly. But listening to like Nick Timrose's article, like some of the you know bringing in like heavy hitters who I learned <laughs> monetary policy from at the Fed, being like, yeah, there's a case for fifty, for and 50. I was like, oh wow. <laughs> like, I'm not just out there. It's like, we're really going to do this. Um, yeah, good for you. But, that's, that's but, awesome. but it shouldn't, I mean, I, I've often said, well, like I left the Fed to work on fiscal policy. That was because of the SOM rule. But I have spent a lot of time talking about the Fed since then, because what I realized is outside of the Fed, like there's not, especially like policy economists who understand the Fed, can explain it. I think in particular, I have uh, a lot of background with the dual mandate aspect. And having worked for these, I mean, I worked for Powell was the third chair that I worked for. So like, you know, I have a sense of the organization. And yet it has always bothered me that my, what I call my Fed decoder ring is -hmm. worth money, right? (laughs) Like it's a public institution. I shouldn't because I know the the secret meaning of recalibrate and like i knew it's like if he was gonna get and i had written in the sub stack that's how they'd frame it as recalibrate because i right. it was really clear jay wanted to cut 50 and i'm like okay what is the lightest touch way to get the votes for 50 and that's i mean that was the lightest touch and it was and it was the most appropriate because say oh we're worried about a recession would have looked pretty silly right yeah. after the what- fact yeah. Um, so, but again, it's just, this was like from having worked there over a decade, you, uh, I absorb this kind of stuff and, but like every, given how important the fed is in markets, mm-hmm. it really would be beneficial if all market participants had that understanding. Right. Right. Like it shouldn't be this kind of guessing game, but that, I mean, that's just the way, you know, the fed's just one piece of markets. <laughs> Yeah. There's always, you know, experts have to filter through a lot of of noise, but um, 
and I guess I enjoy doing it. So yeah, you're having fun. You're very good at it. Obviously, being one of I don't know a handful of folks call for fifty and, and get it. Um, I guess I'll ask you about your thoughts for the rest of the year. There's obviously two Fed meetings. Mm -hmm. One is next week, I think. Uh, one in December. Are you in the camp of they're just going to tinker in a quarter and a quarter? Do you think one? Do you think zero? What, what do you think the rest of the year? I think they're set up for 25 basis point cuts at the next four meetings. Like that, that would be my four big, and the four they take, they take a hundred basis points out and then they kind so of, we're at three, so that, seven, would, five? that would take you to January and March. Um, yeah. And okay. then, and then I think after that, would, that point you can say, are we getting close to neutral or like, I think you're good. I think yeah. they've got another hundred basis points, but more, but there's a lot of data between now and next March. Sure. So I don't want to say that with any certainty, the, they are, it is very hard to come up with a constellation of data this week that would take them off of the 25 basis point cut okay. next week. Now, if we get some really strong uh, data on, with the jobs report, I think the, the conversation will come back up again about, well, we could pause in December and not cut. I think, I think Powell's baseline, and he seems to be pretty good at getting his way, his baseline mm -hmm. would be to just do two more, 20, like do the 25 in November, the 25 in December. They're going to have, the data scene is going to be pretty messy between, sure. like the jobs report will get weighed down probably because of the hurricanes this Friday, but then next month when that un reverses, right. it'll pop it up. So things are just going to be a little messy. So I would imagine if they can be boring and just mm -hmm. do 25, 25, they will. But if, if the data were, again, if they were really, really strong on Friday and like subsequent data, then maybe, you know, there's a case to take a pause in December and we could get some pretty negative data back on the labor market. Um, even on Friday, if the unemployment rate moves up notably, and that's not a place you should see the weather effects, well, then there's that that question mark about how solid is the labor market. And then you could potentially see a 50 in December. I don't think they'll move that quick to it, but I'm not sure that we're I'm not sure we're done with the 50s. Right. Okay. Like it's it, yeah. it could happen. But I but like I said, my base case is we've got about a, another 100 basis points in 25 basis point increments, you know, chop them away and then pick their head up and look around. And hopefully if the world isn't turned yeah. upside down uh, next <laughs> week, they'll, it, it, we, might be, there you go. we might be that far off of neutral. Yeah, I, I think another hundred basis points gets us roughly to three and three quarters. I think that's where all the discussions are. Is like, hey, is it this? Is it that? I think that's where you you really get Fed discussions. Claudia, this has been an amazing conversation. I appreciate you giving us nearly an hour. We obviously have your Twitter handle here at uh, Claudia underscore Psalm, but it sounds like you have a Substack. Can you tell us what that is again? Yeah, so the Substack is Stay at Home Macro, and so Psalm last name, and I write about weekly, and it's. Fed and then just macro data, labor markets, all kinds of various things. Folks, you got to give her a follow. Check out her Substack again. She was one of the handful of people that called the fifty early. That deserves some respect and notice. Again, we're looking at another hundred. I think that makes complete sense. Claudia, you're amazing. Take care. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. All right.